We travelled to Somerset today to visit someone who I first met many years ago. I would like to introduce Charles Dowding, who I'm in conversation with, mainly about his re-released book, which is produced by um, Green Books of Dartington. So Charles, um, when we first met at that Gardener's Question Time panel, the question from the floor actually asked about compost bins and whether we, the panel members, liked nice shiny plastic ones mm. or informal flowing bins. And I came back with my answer that I like um, shiny plastic ones and you came up with the other answer. And from that moment, it's made me realise that there's far more to growing vegetables and edible crops than just the visual appearance. And to me, that's a lot of what your book is about. So let's start at the, the, the very fundamental bit about your book is the no dig concept. Mm. How did you come about that? Why did you start it? I, it was over 30 years ago now, and I was um, starting off as a commercial grower a few miles up the road on stony soil, and I wanted to grow vegetables without weeds. I'd been looking around organic market gardens in 1982, and I saw nothing but masses of weeds. And I felt that gardeners were always on the back foot. The growers, you know, they never got on top of their weeds, and so life was not actually that happy for them. Yes. And so I wanted a system, a method, where I could at least be having very few weeds. And initially, oh, then I came across a book by Ruth Stout, who was very well known in the USA in the 40s, 50s, 60s. And she wrote a book called No Work Garden, which I think because of the title is much yes. sounding bestseller. Yes. Yeah, quite. <laughs> and uh, she um, advocated using a hay mulch because her husband was a farmer, had these old bales of small hay that no good for the cows. And she just put it on, you, know, you just spread it on your garden, basically, and don't ever disturb the soil. Got great results, yes. and very few weeds. So that appealed to me. And then she said things like, when you want to sow your carrots, you just pull the hay back, make it, you see the soil, drop the seed in. When they come up, you just push the hay back, you know, you right. kind of walk away and leave them. It all sounded great. And, and I actually then bought um, a trailer load of slightly spoiled hay more cheaply from a merchant yes. in 1982 for, to spread on my, I had an acre and a half of ground that I was going to grow on. Yes. And I thought, I'll use this hay as a mulch. I'd, I dug beds, in fact, you know, I wasn't, I'm not totally no dig in terms of the initial preparation. Ah, and we'll come back to that in a moment yeah. because that's There's something no I struggle with. Between yes. the two. But in those days, the way I was doing it was my, my father was a farmer. He, yes. he lent me his tractor rotavator, in fact, of all things. And yeah. uh, I rotivated the grass pasture, got loose soil that way, and then I shaped it into beds by hand with my spade on an acre and a half, lovely four foot beds. Yes. And then I mulched all these beds with the rotten hay and I mulched the paths with rotting straw. And I thought, great, I won't have any weeds. And actually, I didn't have that many, but what I did have was slugs. Ah, and yes. then I realised Ruth Stout, she's in Connecticut, I think it is, dry climate, or at least dry summers. Yeah, and that's something we certainly haven't got in the UK. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, then, and I've also noticed in comments on my books on, on, on the website, for example, um, American readers say, oh, he does go on about slugs a lot. <laughs> but actually, slugs are, are, are part of the basis of my gardening approach, because... If, if you let slugs get on the front foot, you know, you're done for, right? yes. as so many people discovered in 2012, Quite. for example. Quite. So um, I realised after only a few months of losing lots of plants in spring 1983 that actually hay mulch is not so good in Britain. And then over a couple of years, I evolved that. I took the method, if you like, the yes. mulch, surface mulch, yes. no dig, but using compost instead. Yes. So with that... The I can see the concept of it, even though I've been digging soil for many, many years, and I can see why you shouldn't dig. But I still struggle slightly. A, a reader of your book who's new to vegetable gardening yeah. or a new garden, how would they go about starting the, or stopping or starting the no-dig yeah. concept? Because yeah. a builder's plot or whatever, yeah. it could be incredibly daunting to think that. Yeah. Well, certainly I would say two things. One is that, you know, if you need to dig in the first place, fair enough. You right. know, sometimes it is necessary. And, yes. and uh, I have a friend in Nottingham, for example, who took on a derelict allotment. And he actually dug out half a skip full of plastic and metal and that kind right. of thing. So yeah. there are situations where digging to yes. clean soil is fine. And certain weeds I'd recommend digging out, like docks. Yes, and if really perennial weeds perennials. that are going to keep coming back. Yes. And not all perennials, but the, the bigger ones with more woody stems yes. or or fat roots that, you know, one slice with a spade and, and it's out, it's gone. Right. And it's harder to mulch docks than it is to actually just physically remove them with a spade. So that's fine. Yes. And then, um, but the other thing is, the, I think once one gets a hold of the grass 
the concept of no dig, which is about encouraging soil life through organic matter on top. And that soil life, when fed yes. and not disturbed, actually gets more and more active and does the digging for you. Absolutely. And that's the fundamental bit about it, isn't it? Yeah. You've got to know that the natural processes will take over because yeah. nature's been doing it for far it's, longer than we it's have. It's an element of trust. And, and it, what hasn't helped gardeners to, to get a hold of it, I think, is being told so often the opposite. Yes. And, and you almost have to sort of clean your brain of all those... You know, it's coming up yes. all the time. Yes. Almost every article, book you pick up, you know, first step is dig your plot. Yes, and, and remove everything that isn't or is potentially yeah. alien to yeah. your production of crops. Yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, you can do that. That yes. can be a, a viable yeah. first step. Yes. And if you want to do that, fine. You know, yes. if you want to literally dig out every bit of grass or weed that's growing, you, right. that is a possible way to start. But then, yeah, just don't dig anymore. And that absence of further cultivation will massively reduce weed growth. Right, because your book is very much about reducing the amount of labour needed and, of course, weeding yeah. is one of the biggest labour factors in growing edible crops, as you said earlier. It really is. And like, to give you an example, last year on, on I was growing, cropping an acre yes. of no-dig beds. Yes. And in the really wet summer of 2012, where it was almost impossible to find a moment to hoe at any stage, yes. I actually managed very simply and easily to keep on top of weed growth. And, yes. and there are two factors in that. One is the no dig means less germinate in the first place because the soil has been disturbed. Uh, yeah, quite. And they're still down below. They stay uh, there. And they're not yeah. Um, yeah. subject to light, yeah. which yeah. Yeah. simulates germination, yeah. of course. And, yeah. and I think there's another part of that, which is, is in a way more interesting, but harder to prove. And, and uh, which is, I've, from what I've observed over many years, including rotivating that I've done myself, I right. think disturbed soil is in a somewhat agitated state and weeds are part of its healing process. Yes, I read that in your book. And I, that's something that is very new to me. Right, yeah. Um, and, and that might sound wacky to a lot of people. But yeah. I honestly, I'm coming to think that from what I've observed. Right. You know, because um, sometimes even in the compost, I suppose there's quite a lot of weed season. I just don't think they all germinate because, you know, there's not that factor of disturbance triggering the growth, even if they might have and been... And whatever that trigger may be, whether it's yeah, whatever light it is. or geo, yeah, whatever it is. geo something. Yeah. I mean, sometimes one can't put precise explanations to things, but it's still very important to observe and yes. to, you know, yes. to accept that that's happening. Yes. And actually, there's one further thing I say about weeds, which is, I think, um, one needs a mindset where you, you, you go out and get them small, I think. Before they seed? Well, that's for one thing, yes. for sure, but yes. before they even get big, because if you think about it, a weed germinating into yes. a tiny little seedling, yes. um, if you leave it to grow two or three weeks, it doesn't do much often, is a bigger weed. And it's, it's just that much more work to deal with. So, of you know, it's just yep. common sense, really, to me. And, yeah. and so that's always been my approach. And it, um, it is an, an old maxim that you, you hoe before you even see the, the weeds. And, and that's a good one. Because if, yeah. you if you know you or suspect yes. lots of weed seedlings coming yes. out, running the hoe yes. through the soil really yes. helps. And that kind of just comes to the accessibility of the plants, which is where your raised beds come in, because mm -hmm. you're walking on the paths yep. in between the beds and therefore yep. not disturbing yep. and compacting the soil, yep. which would no doubt destroy all the work that you've just been talking well, about. Well, yes and no, actually. Ah, right, okay. See, that's another interesting one, because what I've noticed is that undug, undisturbed soil, actually develops and retains a firmer structure than cultivated soil. Yes. So quite often I am walking on my beds, not deliberately doing mm -hmm. so but if I need to for access reasons right. or sometimes I've got quite wide beds actually yes. and I put a foot on while I'm picking things and it, I find it doesn't hurt because the soil has acquired you know kind of matrix structure you think of all those worm channels that are in there they, they don't disappear in the way that um, mechanically created tilth does so it's firm but it's difference between firm and compact oh, very much so especially on heavier soils yep. and yep. this principle of no dig mm -hmm. works on more or less any type of soil. Well, uh, yeah, the, the, the first question I think many gardeners would ask, you know, what about if you've got clay? Well, my last garden was on heavy clay, and yeah. actually I had another garden in France for five years on really heavy clay, you know, horrible mm. white clay. And no dig has worked very well on both of those heavy, dense soils, yes. which were suffering when I started from drainage problems. Yes. And then over time, putting the organic matter on top, yes. feeding the soil life, yes. the drainage sorted itself out. And talking of organic matter, of course, for you, the best source of organic matter is from your compost heaps. Yeah. Well, compost, that's another interesting yeah, word. Absolutely. There, because um, th this is where some confusion can arise in, in terms of compost and manures. Yes. Usually when I use the word compost, I'm meaning um, either my own compost or compost, composted manure. Yes. And, and sometimes I buy it in. So it's not only my own. I'm 
for particularly for commercial growing, it's yes. very difficult to, to get the nothing. quantity. Yes. Yeah. 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 And yeah. and um, you know we'll see when we go out the, that I'm using quite large quantities in certain cases, but that's the first stage of yes. mulching, yes. killing weeds. Yes. Um, but actually, yeah, in the long run of things, I use about an inch and a half a year on the surface, just to. So every area that's been cultivated will receive an inch and a half ish of. Sorry, compost. what was that word you used? Did you say cultivated? <laughs> uh, cropped. Cropped, that's it. Yeah. I stand corrected. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, good point. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. So yeah. that supply of organic matter. Yeah, once a year I, I put it on, even if I'm double cropping. I find oh, that's really? enough, yeah. And, and it, again, it comes back to what you mentioned earlier, that simplification idea. Um, a lot of what I teach is, is actually about simplifying things. And there's certainly not as full of fantastically looking edible crops. I would just love to go and harvest neat. But Charles, thank you very much indeed for uh, allowing us to come and talk about your books. The information details about um, the books that Charles has written and published by Green Books will be on the screen for everyone to see. So I hope that was of interest and you too will be inspired to grow a larger range of edible crops. Uh, thanks thank very you. much indeed Charles. Thank yeah, you. That's very good. Um, but yeah, that's, well I uh, thought I was just getting going. <laughs>